Today we have uh, one of our visitors, uh, Damien Chibilski, uh, here. And um, Damien got his uh, PhD at Monash University fairly recently, and he's now a postdoc at the Max Planck in uh, Germany. Uh, today, well, he's here uh, visiting Matthias Rempel, uh, working with him and various other people on uh, chromospheric simulations with uh, Muram. But today he's going to talk not about that, although we'd be very interested to hear about that as well. Today he's going to talk about spectrophotometry of a sunspot simulation. Damien? Okay, so is this the mic working or should I? Okay, so yeah, I'm currently at Max Planck in the Solar MHD group working with Miram, but I didn't really want to give a hour long implementation talk, so I decided to talk about some stuff from my previous life in Monash, where I was looking at how waves that, uh, travel through and mode conversion inside of sunspots. And I was supervised by Sergei Shoyag and Paul Kelly at the Monash Center for Astrophysics. OK, so just a basic outline slide. So what is local helioseismology? In the sun, in the convection zone, we have just this stochastic generation of sound waves which we can use as sources to perform seismology. So these are the surface mode and the pressure modes, and these bounce around inside the sun. So the picture to the top right shows how a pressure mode would travel through the sun. We have different wavelengths and different frequencies, and these can be shallower surface modes or deeper interior modes. And the depth these waves travel depend on their wavelength and their frequency. Um, the bottom is meant to be a movie. I can't tell if it's plain, but what this shows is what we observe. So this is an image from the HMI, the helioseismic imager, aboard the STO spacecraft. And this is primarily what I use, or the people I work with use, to observe the velocities at the solar surface. So this is a Doppler shift of these waves as they travel through the solar interior. So to perform local seismology, these different modes appear if we take a frequency and wave number diagram, we see different ridges of power, which are the frequencies and wave numbers at which these normal modes occur. So there's different methods of performing local seismology. Two of the main ones are ring diagram analysis and time distance seismology. So in time distance seismology, we follow a ray's path and we measure it either the end. And then from how, uh, how long it took, we infer the subsurface structure. And the second is ring diagram analysis, where we calculate a local power spectrum, kind of like this one, and we try and fit it. So I'm more in the forward modeling side of things. And particularly, I want to see what we can find out about sunspots. So currently, sunspot seismology has obtained pretty good measurements of the sort of thermal structure of a sunspot, by which I mean the Wilson depression. So my next slide shows when we see a sunspot due to its cooler temperature, the, form the height at which the light we observe is formed is depressed into deeper into the solar surface. And we call this the Wilson depression, or the, the depression of the surface of the sun due to the magnetic field. Well, due to a bunch of effects, but based on the magnetic field. And so this is an image of the sun and the sunspot. So down the bottom, we see the depth at which light is able to escape, or the depth below the surface at which the Wilson depression is. And we've overplotted. The umbra is the little white, uh, the inner contour, and the penumbra is the outer contour. So if I go back to my first slide, this shows a sunspot as we see it in optical. And the umbra is the inner dark region, and the penumbra is the filamentary structure that goes out from that. So one of the ways we observe sunspots is by making maps of the power of the waves as we see them in the surface. So what I mean by that is if we take each point around a sunspot and we take a Fourier transform, we observe it for a time, say 6, 12 hours. We take a Fourier transform, we get the power. 
and then we bin that into different frequencies, so four, six millihertz, and we see where there's regions of high power in and around the sunspot. And so this image was kind of what got me going on this project. And what we're seeing here is the left figure is from MDI, and we've binned it, we're looking at how the power varies at six millihertz. And we're looking at different positions on the solar disk. And if we look at, sorry, I'll have to look at this. If we look at 60 degrees inclination in one direction, and then we look slowly tilting till we get to zero degrees, and then back to the other side, we see some weird things in the umbra of a sunspot, particularly this little crescent shaped thing that appears. And there's a, lot of peop there's a lot of arguments that this is very close to the noise floor and just can be noise in a sunspot model, but we thought there might be some wave explanation to how and why it's there. And so the picture to the right is from the HMI instrument, and it shows different frequencies, what you see in and around a sunspot at different frequencies. So at three and four millihertz, you see basically a dark umbra, and you start seeing some interesting things at higher frequencies. You get these acoustic halos or uh, increased power around a sunspot. And these are all due to how magnetic fields change sound waves as they travel through the sun. OK, so this is just a gist of what I talk about. So I'm going to talk about how magnetic waves travel for a while, how magnetohydrodynamic waves travel through a sunspot. I'll talk a little bit about spectral synthesis and how we make synthetic observations of our simulations. We don't just want to look at our simulations, we want to directly <coughs> compare our results to what people observe with the HMI spacecraft. And I'll describe the model I've generated and the results of some of my simulations. So MHD waves get a lot more complicated. Is the movie playing? Yes, it is, wonderful. So as an acoustic sound wave travels into a magnetic field region, it splits into a number of branches. You have a slow wave and you have a fast wave. So the fast wave continues to behave more like a sound wave would, where the slow wave does some interesting things. So a slow wave, when it hits a magnetic field, it travels along the magnetic field line. And the direction of fluid displacement depends on whether you're in a high magnetic field region, where the local alpha velocity or the speed at which a magnetic wave will travel is higher than the sound speed, or whether you're in a sound speed dominated region. So this picture up the top, if we have our waves traveling, our fast wave traveling, and this is the direction of our magnetic field, and this is, shows how the actual fluid displacement varies with the direction the wave travels. So for a fast wave in an acoustically, or a, that's just behaving like a normal sound wave, it travels isotropically, ignores the background magnetic field. But once we introduce a magnetic field, we start seeing differences in how the actual fluid will move as the wave travels. And one thing that's of particular importance in my talk, so I'll point it out, is these slow magnetic waves, that or they travel along the magnetic field line, they oscillate perpendicularly to the magnetic field line. So you'll see them at a horizontal velocity. And so this movie down the bottom, if I can make it restart, is it automatically playing? Shows how two different waves would travel through a sunspot. So this is a movie, a nice movie made by Elena Homenko, and it shows how a magnetic wave travels compared to how it would travel if it was just purely a sound wave. So the red shows just a pure sound wave that only sees the local gas and fluid properties. And the white shows how a magnetic wave is changed. And so it affects two things. It affects the speed at which the wave travels, but it also affects how high into the atmosphere this wave can travel. And all these are frequency dependent and directionally dependent effects. So when we're looking, when we're making measurements by looking at 
how long our waves take to travel through the solar interior, if we're not properly understanding these processes, we're going to be making mistakes. So one of the important things I need to talk about is how waves transition between these two branches, between the fast branch and the slow branch. So typically what you see is you'll have an acoustic sound wave or a fast wave traveling through the solar interior and it will encounter, say, a sunspot or a strong magnetic field region. And then you'll see this fast wave come up and it hits the region where the magnetic velocity, uh, the alpha velocity and the sound speed are equal. And at this point you get conversion into the different branches. And you'll see the slow wave continue to travel along the magnetic field where the fast wave travels up into the atmosphere and turns before returning again. So you lose energy to these different branches and as you travel down, you'll convert again into a slow wave. And there is also an alphenic wave, which is a purely magnetic a torsional oscillation, but I'm not going to talk about that much in my uh, talk, but you have to be aware that this will also lose en you'll lose energy to this and this will continue to affect your travel time measurements or whatever measurements you're making. And one thing is that the direction of the magnetic field at the point where these waves hit this transition region depends uh, the strength of the conversion to slow waves or whether it continues in sound wave depends on the angle of the magnetic field. So if you travel along the magnetic field, you get very strong conversion to slow modes, whereas if you're traveling against it, you get relatively weak conversion to slow modes. So now I'm going to talk about how we observe my simulations. So as I said before, the HMI spacecraft is the main way we look at what's going on for a seismology. And the way we do this is by measuring a spectral line, and then we uh, sample that with a bunch of Gaussian filters, and then we calculate velocity shifts from this. Or another way to do it is to take a spectral line and measure the midpoint, and then uh, see how the shift in that midpoint is. And the reason this works is because different regions is that the spectral line are formed at different heights in the atmosphere. So if we're looking at the continuum or the outsides, they're formed deeper in the atmosphere, and the uh, line core is formed higher up in the atmosphere. So using the, the measurement of one spectral line, we can make three-dimensional images of our solar atmosphere. And so we take our simulation box. So this is a picture of a Muram snapshot and we put in the pressure and the density and the physical parameters we have. And from that, we simulate a spectral line by solving the radiation transport equation, where we have I is our intensity and our polarization vector. And we have a K, which is an absorption matrix, and J, which is an emission matrix. And they depend on the local thermodynamics of what's going on in our simulation box. And we solve this up pixel by pixel until we get an output radiation spectrum from our simulation. And so this is just the gist of how that works. We have a simulation. We put this into our spectral synthesis routine. And from this, we get something similar to what we would observe in the real sun. And then we try to calculate observations from those spectra rather than calculating them just from our simulation velocities and magnetic fields. And the advantage of this is we can also then go back into our simulation and figure out exactly what's happening and why certain things appear the way they do. So to do that first, I had to make a sunspot model. So this, you gotta be careful, this is, it should be squished. So the horizontal, this shows the radius out from the sunspot center, and this shows the height in the atmosphere but they're not to the same scale. So this is a very elongated sunspot. And we had a bit of trouble because we wanted to make a sunspot model that we could run our simulations on, but while at the same time having one that we could calculate the radiation spectrum from 
and get something that actually looked kind of okay. And so I messed around a lot with the Sunspot model of Elena Homenko and just tweaked it to get as close to the uh, radiation spectrum you see from the real sun while still being able to run our simulations. And so this, the white lines show the magnetic field lines of the sunspot. And there's two important things in here. I'm not sure how well you can see them on the projector, but there's this red line shows the line at which 6173, or the radiation that we observe, begins to be formed. And this yellow line that crosses it is the line where the sound speed is equal to the alpha velocity. So this is the line at which we transition from a sort of acoustic waves to magnetically dominated waves. And they cross at about seven megameters radius. So we can observe our sunspot. We can calculate an intensity map. So what we've done here is, this is if we were observing at the center of the sun and we calculated the radiation, this is what my sunspot would look like in 617 in continuum for the HMI uh, instrument. And then what we've done is we've inclined our simulation so we can look at a variety of angles. And the reason we want to do this is because we can only accurately measure a Doppler shift along the line of sight. So if we want to see these slow waves which travel perpendicularly to a largely vertical magnetic field, we need to look at an angle to the solar surface. So we need to be able to synthesize a vertical or a disk center sunspot and then we need to synthesize something that looks like it was towards the solar limb. And we can see we get a pretty good limb darkening curve, and you can s the sunspot gets smushed up at the same time. And then we wanted to look at how and where these radiation is formed. So this is a response function. And what I mean by that is we take our sunspot model and we put a velocity perturbation at one point in height. And then we see how that affects our, mag our output spectral line. So the one, where are my glasses? The one in the top left shows what we see if we look at disk center, so straight at the sun vertically, and we're looking at a non-magnetic pixel of our simulation. And you see you get depending on where you are. So if you have your velocity perturbation at the solar surface, you get a Doppler shift. And as you go higher in the atmosphere, you get a Doppler shift closer to the line core. And if we look in the umbra, where we have a very strong magnetic field, we get Zeeman splitting of our spectral line. And so you get two separate regions of Doppler shifted uh, spectral line. But you also see that the height at which it forms goes down to 400 kilometers, which is the Wilson depression of the sunspot. And the region along the ray where this spectral line is allowed to form is also much narrower. And then as we incline down to 60 degrees, everything starts getting really messy. And this is because we have strong gradients of magnetic field and we have different components of the spectral line. And we start observing along a much larger region of the solar atmosphere. So all this is going to complicate what's already a complicated situation, because we now no longer have, we have non-local, we have non-locality of what we actually measure due to the differences in how the radiation is formed in our sunspot. And this is a fairly simple sunspot model, so it only gets worse. So now we wanted to run some wave simulations in this sunspot model to see what we can find. So this picture shows, these two movies show two things. The top one shows the continuum intensity. So the variation, it shows a shift in intensity, the variation in how the intensity of the surface would look because of this wave traveling through our sunspot model. And the top right shows the velocity that would be measured if we used a technique similar to how the HMI satellite does. So this white 
circle is our sunspot umbra. So that's the region of strongest magnetic field. And you can see a number of things happening. You can see as the wave travels through, so we have a pulse driver here, which is just spatially localized. And as it travels through the sunspot, you see phase differences behind and inside the umbra due to the waves traveling higher in the atmosphere. And if we look at this one, this isn't an observation or an observation. This is inside our sunspot, the horizontal vertical perturbation, the horizontal perturbations. And you see that as the wave encounters the magnetic field lines, you get these slow modes traveling down into the solar interior. So what we wanted to see next is what what's the acoustic power or those acoustic power maps I showed at the beginning. We wanted to see how do these look for our simulated sunspot. So I made a series of maps. So from left to right, we have different frequencies. We have 3 millihertz, 4 millihertz, 5 millihertz, up to 7. And I have measurements at three different angles. The center shows if we were looking at disk center, the sunspot. The top one shows if it was inclined towards the observer down the bottom. And this one shows if the observer was up the top and we were reclining at 60 degrees. And this is just at the continuum height. So it shows close to what the HMI instrument would observe. Um, and you can see in the 3 and 4 millihertz wave, uh, wavelengths, frequencies, you get almost total absorption of the waves as they travel through the sunspot. Uh, one of the striking things in this is so the white is my umbra, and my pulse is located somewhere in the middle of this black dot. You see these concentric rings going outward from the pulse. And what these are is, because we have a multi-frequency spatially localized pulse, these are kind of a spatial analog of that ridge diagram I showed earlier. We have specific frequencies where these waves will uh, show, up, show up brighter. And then we can see as we travel through the sunspot and higher frequencies, we start seeing waves make it through to the other side. But we see a significant deformation in that ridge or that wave, that pattern, due to their travel through the magnetic field. One thing we see is that the umber is completely dark. But this is looking at our continuum formation height. So if we then scan down the spectral line, so we're starting at deep in the sun's atmosphere and we're scanning down the spectral line, which is going up higher into the atmosphere of the sun. And we're plotting the same three things, and we're seeing what we observe. So at the start, when you're observing at the, con the formation, continuum formation height, or you're observing deep in the atmosphere, you don't see anything in the umbra. You notice at disk center, as you go higher, you see very little change throughout the spectral line in the velocity you observe. But in the line core, you see, is it going to replay? You see this bright point appearing on either side, depending on which side your observations are made at. So because this is a simulation, we can then go into our actual data and see what's happening at these points in uh, the atmosphere. And if you go in, you'll notice that, so this is an observation at 60 degrees from the vertical. And if we look at this radius in our sunspot model, it's inclined 30 degrees from the vertical. So this bright dot is appearing exactly when we're looking perpendicular to the magnetic field. And it's just a little bit further out from uh, where the formation height and the, the region where it becomes magnetically dominated cross. So what we're seeing is our fast wave travels up, converts, and then these slow modes travel down into the solar interior. And we're just looking at the perfect inclination to pick out these really strongly. And depending on the variation in inclination, you'll pick them out at different points around the sunspot umbra. So 
these rings within the sunspot can be observations of slow modes within a sunspot within the umbra. And this is just showing us the snapshot of a line core where you can more clearly see the crescent. And if we take a slice, so a vertical slice through our spectral line, we can see that this is a very spatially localized feature. So at the bottom here, we're observing at 60 degrees, and we're observing up in our atmosphere, which means we're observing different points in the spectral line and across in uh, radius, I guess, from the sunspot umbra. And you can see that this bright point is located in a very small region. So depending on your thermal structure and your sunspot geometry, you may see something, you may see nothing. But it will be interesting to see if we can use these waves to probe our sunspot. So what I want to do next is there's some people in Tenerife, I think, doing multi-height measurements. So you take, you take two spectral lines, and then you can look at the phase differences between these two spectral lines. And I want to look into this and see if we can use the phase differences of these slow modes, and we can see how these slow modes appear, and we can try and use that to probe what's going on in and around the sunspot a little bit. And it also shows that we have to be a little careful when we're observing within a sunspot. So I've used the same spectral line, but I haven't used the same data analysis techniques that are used within the HMI instrument. So another thing I'd like to do in the future is directly apply the HMI pipeline to these simulations. So I'm a MURAM guy now, so my plan is to make a MURAM sunspot and synthesize this spectral line and try and apply the HMI pipeline to it and try and figure out what we can actually use from our observations within a sunspot. And then maybe we can find new ways to probe the magnetic field, because we haven't had too much luck so far. Uh, anyway, that's what I have, so thank you. Damien had already warned me that this would be a slightly shorter talk than maybe our usual, yeah. but it does leave plenty of time for questions. So, any questions? Charlie. That was great, and I'm sorry I missed most of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Damien, you have said something to us yesterday that has struck me. And um, I would like to see the different parts of my experience in my field. would like to see these simulations run. Okay. So that one can take the difference. And I think that one of the important reasons the difference would come out would be that, um, or that is that the different slides show, would be the distinction, for example, between regions in the sunspot in which the sensitivity to upcoming acoustic waves is suppressed and actual sources in the sunspot due to the sunspot scattering waves or does it actually eat up the wave and, and simply disappear in it? If you take the difference between these, then you expect that, that scattering sources will actually be clear because of waves apparently coming out of them that were simply scattered. But, you know, so you mean run the same driver in a box with no magnetic field and a box with a magnetic field right. and see what's different. You can do that, but because all your sound waves are traveling at different speeds, once you get, we, I mean, Carlos was doing this a bit, and we tried looking at it, but your waves are no longer moving at the same speed. So when you take a difference, you're not really taking a difference between the same things anymore. And so you can find things that are different purely because there's a bit of a lag between your waves. And maybe you won't see the, maybe that's greater than the scattering you're trying to find or yeah. the absorption you're trying to find. Yeah, it probably is. Um, so, well, since you've done it, then you've already taken my advice. Uh, and I've just <laughs> wanted to see it. But, um, but for example, um, for weak scatterers, uh, um, if something called the form approximation applies, and the idea is that something only gets scattered once. Now, if that's no longer true, then it doesn't take very long before things become confused. And then there are other Very difficult. 
results are I mean, very easy to think that it's a acoustic signature is suppressed that it's absorbing waves or doing away with them. That's not necessarily true, and so that's the kind of diagnostic that that was not. Okay, yeah, Carlos was doing acoustic halo stuff. He did a bit more in depth in the acoustic halo, but he kind of used the same model as me and the same simulations, just with different drivers. And you can get some thing out of it, because, I mean, the halo forms because you have this turning of fast acoustic waves, and then you have a bright point, because at the point where these waves re sort of bounce, you have two sources of fast waves, and so you have a bright ring. And then if you go further out, you just happen to enter the region where you get great conversion to alpha waves, and you get a moat there. And then if you go further out again, you see another kind of bright halo region. And he was doing this by comparing like a quiet sun to a non-quiet region. And I don't, I think it can over-exaggerate the differences. So I don't know. Maybe there's a nice way to do it. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things in there that we don't really use. There's a lot going on in sunspots, and there's got to be something in there we can use to try and image them. <laughs> Somebody else? Um, yeah, just um, I guess some general comments that, or really an invitation for you to comment on, are, you know, I think the neuron simulations have really revolutionized local heliocyte models and told us a lot of things that are right and wrong, for example. Yeah. And so I'd be I'd welcome comments about the kind of improvements that we can do to those kinds of models. Uh, and second, <laughs> for example, that was an example. I've yet to see, and we talked a little bit about the second, but I've yet to see someone produce um, you know Take, take a neuron-like simulation and produce artificial HMI-like data to see how well we measure the basic quantities, velocities, and things. So that's one thing I want to do, and hopefully I'll have time. But <laughs> I'm currently in the middle of understanding a new sort of region of solar physics. Um, I think it's something I can do on the side. I mean, I need to get the simulation set up and started, but I've already got all the I mean, there's no difference in sizing a MIRAM simulation to my simulation. You just change how you load data in. So I've already got it all written. I just need a computer to do it on. The problem with MIRAM simulations is I can make a sunspot that looks like and gives a similar, or Robert has done this previously. He made a sunspot that gives a similar helioseismic sort of response as the one in MIRAM, but the MIRAM simulations are great, but they're also expensive. So if we want to develop any method, we need to be able to do cheap simulations. And so we need sort of a MIRAM-inspired model, but we also need something we can run many simulations in. We can vary the magnetic field. We can vary the thermal structure. We can, so it's kind of something you have to do both and then use the MIRAM to validate sort of how you work. So. I don't know, you guys are doing holography, and before Hamed retired from science, he was doing, trying to do directionally dependent time distance seismology where, I mean, a magnetic field, if you fire a ray through it in one direction, and you fire a ray in the other direction, you'll get a completely different travel time signature. Whereas if you just have a thermal thing, you'll get essentially the same travel time. And so he was trying to figure out a way to use this to perhaps look at our magnetic field, but that would be something that would be cool to look at. Or Shravan has his sort of full waveform inversions where he does a relaxation to a model of a sunspot and changes that based on what his simulation shows to the observations and then iterates until he hopefully gets something right. So like you can test those with MURAM, but to kind of, you need something you can run cheaply to actually. So I need to do both. Or well, someone needs to do both. So hey. Probably.
probably. So the problem with fast waves is, I mean, there's such high wavelength, long wavelengths that any small structure is just going to disappear. But maybe we can use some of these slow modes. I mean, again, one of the guys, Tobias in Tenerife, was looking at if you sort of shake the base of the sunspot, you get a slow mode or a running penumbral wave traveling up and along the field line, and based on where in the sunspot you excited these waves, you can see differences in their speed and how they travel. So I maybe you could use that to try and figure out, is there a difference in, I mean, is your sunspot deep or shallow? Is it monolithic or based on how these waves that would be formed by buffeting convection then travel out and through the sunspot? I don't know, maybe there's something there. Maybe I'm just... <laughs> like a global oscillation of a sunspot. That's the goal, but currently we can only, I think Doug and Charlie know more about this than me, but we can only really accurately image the thermal structure. We have no luck looking at, I mean, subsurface detection of magnetic fields is a pipe dream still, and we even have trouble with flows in and around sunspots. So we have to be incremental. So that's like the goal, is if we could figure out is our sunspot a deep thing, or is it a shallow formation of magnetic field that's been smushed together by convection or how what's happening but little steps <laughs> hopefully I don't know can you make a spaghetti sunspot Matthias Lots of problems. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. So we saw the linear, we, we have a static background and we just put waves through. Yeah, magnetohydrostatic equilibrium. Because if it's not in equilibrium, then you just get a convective instability in your simulation bag. So that's what we've done. We've linearized it. But even if you don't linearize it, if you have a stable background, it will okay. remain more stable. It's not perfect, but. Murem has radiation and other things that will then destabilize and you'll get convection. So you, you will always get convection in a Murem box unless you turn off the radiation. And then you just kind of, I don't know, you can use another code that's been designed for this to do it a bit better. So this, I've been using a code of Shravan's called Spark that I've kind of rewritten to be faster. But there's also Mancha is a code of Elena Hemenko and Tobias Philippe's. So these wave these wave specific codes, they can't do 
what MURAM does, but they can do a static background case much faster. And when you want, say, 24 hours of data at a reasonable resolution, a MURAM simulation, if you wanted to do three sunspots, is going to take you a lot of computer time, whereas these nice linearized simulations are a lot quicker. And you don't have the convective noise, so they're also a bit nicer to look at. Does that answer the question? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'd like to do. That's that's what I want to look at. So I, I know I read a thesis of someone, Iransu, who was at Tenerife and she had looked at phase differences between two different heights. And I remember being at a conference with an instrument called Hellride that took it was specifically designed to take a number of slices in the atmosphere and then look at the phase differences between them. But to my knowledge, no one's really done this in a simulation before. So it's something that I think would be interesting to look at and see if we can, yeah, look at how the field changes based on the phase of the slow mode. I think it will. I just don't know exactly what I'm going to get. And I'm kind of doing this on the side now. So, But I'd like people. If anyone wants sort of to look at something like this, I'm always around and I've got all my codes and I can help if you want to look into observing something in these models. Hey. It's it only seems to occur at higher frequencies, but that's most likely because the conversion to it's most likely due to how the wave the fast wave travels through the sunspot and then the conversion to slow mode is also frequency dependent so it's to do with the frequency dependence of fast waves converting to slow waves so this frequency and space so it appears as a if you if you sort of observed from all angles it would be a ring depending on the field line inclination and if you adjusted your inclination that ring would move but if you adjust it too much then I mean you need a particular point in the sunspot where you're, uh, you're observing below your region where mode conversion occurs so it's dependent that whether or not you see this is dependent not only on the field geometry but also on the sort of thermodynamics, because if your line formation region is shifted a little, you just wouldn't see this, at least in this spectral line. I mean, people have observed similar things in, I believe, G-band a bit higher up, and there's some old ground-based observations where they observe something that looks similar, but no one had really looked at it. But yeah, it's a high frequency thing, sort of, it only really appears six plus millihertz, which is kind of the limit of what we can see, because once you get above what the acoustic cutoff is about five and a half millihertz, so once you get above that, your waves no longer turn, they just escape into the atmosphere. And so you won't see this as strongly because you don't have trapped sound waves at that frequency. Uh, Charlie said it's very, very close to the noise floor in a lot of cases. but. There's no other alternative I know of seeing this. I mean, this is a simulation. There's no, there's nothing else I know of that could create this signature. I mean, I'm happy for someone else, but in a simulation where we have no noise in our observation, yeah, I don't mean yeah in the data. So it, it appears differently in many sunspots, and in some of them, it's most likely just noise in your instrument because you don't have many photons in your sunspot. But in others, I mean, you see some like that. If you look at the two pictures I showed at the beginning, this one shows kind of a clear ring that changes depending on how you're inclined. It changes the side of the umbra. Whereas this one looks a bit. So it's, yeah, it's hard to tell. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, every every observation I've seen of a sunspot like this, or at least there's many, many that have this ring in the middle. It's just, I don't know if a lot of people mask them or ignore them or, but it, it's not something that has been talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why I like talking about this, because I'm kind of an MHD theory guy. And if people can give me ideas on how to better observe this and better try and figure out what's going on, then. Yeah, maybe. And yeah, also, you could do a few slices at different heights with DKIST and see if these slow modes or how they vary as you travel up. I mean, I don't know enough about kiss to really comment on how well it would do. Yeah, I only really talked about Stokes I. That's one thing. I don't know what would happen if you use the I minus V and I plus V like HMI does. It may make things better, it may make things worse. I'm not sure. I need to I need to find the code that directly does what HMI does. So we have sort of done all the different polarizations, but we only really used the Doppler shifts in this. 